Sporties would like to welcome you to our What You Should Know video series. These videotapes have been designed as a companion to your flight training to enhance and magnify the training you'll be receiving in person from your instructor. Although we'll be showing you how some maneuvers are performed, you will still need to receive quality, personal flight training. This is Volume 1, What You Should Know in Your First Few Hours. Flying airplanes is one of the most challenging, interesting, and rewarding activities available to individuals today. Not only is flying useful for transportation, it's a lot of fun. Virtually everyone who flies honestly loves it. And where there is a lot to learn and a lot to remember, it need not be intimidating. Take it as a challenge, relax, and enjoy flying. One of the primary purposes of this series of videotapes is to reinforce your flight training. You might be able to spend only an hour and a half at the airport for a lesson, but you can review the video as often as you like and refer back to our handy index, which allows you to locate topics quickly and easily for review, now and in the future. Even though the FAA required flying time for a private pilot certificate is 40 hours, the actual national average time required to earn a private pilot certificate is about 74 hours. By constantly reinforcing actual flight training with these videos, you undoubtedly will be able to do better than the average, more than saving the cost of these tapes. These tapes are not designed just to pass a test. They are designed to achieve exactly the goal in their title, what you should know. They will cover everything that you need to know to pass the test, plus a lot more. Each volume covers a specific segment of learning to fly, with this first one covering what you should know in your first few hours of flight instruction. Volume 2 expands on that information for the next phase of your training, what you should know before practicing landings. The next, Volume 3, will take you through one of the most satisfying parts of flight training, something you will remember forever, that first solo flight. Volume 4 is what you should know for a recreational pilot certificate. When going on for your private pilot certificate, Volume 5 takes you on your dual cross-countries, while Volume 6 addresses what you should know before your solo cross-country flights. Volume 7 puts it all together in preparation for your private pilot test. Your host is Rob Ryder. A pilot since 1973, Rob is active in the Civil Air Patrol and is a real aviation enthusiast. He occasionally serves as announcer for air shows and also hosts many other sporties videotapes. In addition to the basic information, Rob will be sharing with you valuable aviation lore gleaned over the years by sporties experienced staff. This is real world knowledge you won't find in any instruction manual or book. Your first lesson, discovery time. We are about to begin learning the elements of flying and one of the first happens to be weather. Flying is challenging, interesting, and downright fun. And there's absolutely no reason that your flying lessons shouldn't be thoroughly enjoyable as well. Before ever leaving the ground, each pilot must make an important decision, whether to fly or not, commonly referred to as the go, no-go decision. And even though you're a student pilot, the operative word is pilot. And you, along with your instructor, should make this decision each lesson based on several factors. Among these factors is weather. With that in mind, let's talk about when you should fly. Any time of the year can be a great time to fly. And each of the four seasons has its own advantages and disadvantages for you as a pilot. Summer's warm weather is great and typically offers many flyable days. But summer storms are not to be trifled with and are always a reason to delay a lesson if they are near. Visibility is a factor you need to consider in making your go-no-go no go decision. Since you will be training under visual flight rules, or VFR, three miles is considered the lowest practical visibility. However, your training should be conducted in better conditions than that. Winter offers the clearest air of the four seasons, and since cold air is more dense than warm air, aircraft performance is at its peak. Wind conditions are something else that will affect your training. In the early stages of your flight training, brisk winds may be good reason for postponing a lesson. You'll learn very little if all you're doing is battling the wind. Winds not aligned with the only available runway can present a real challenge to new students. 
Ideally, you always want to take off and land into the wind, but this isn't always possible, and you'll learn to negotiate crosswinds with ease later in your training. Cloud cover is also a consideration. Again, visual flight rules specify a minimum ceiling height of a thousand feet above the ground. But that is a minimum, and you definitely want it to be higher than that for most flights. A ceiling is the lowest cloud layer that covers most of the sky. If it is solid, it's called overcast. A broken ceiling is simply an overcast with a few holes in it. For now, you'll be working with your flight instructor to examine the weather conditions and determine if a flight lesson is appropriate or not. We'll cover weather and the many sources of obtaining weather information in much more depth in later tapes. Flight training is a year-round process, which is good, because after you get your certificate, you'll be flying year-round, so there are advantages to training in each of the different seasons. Whether to fly at night or day, on the other hand, is as clear as well, night and day. As you begin your training, you'll want to fly only during the day. The horizon and other outside references you'll need must be clearly visible as you learn the fundamentals of aircraft control. Later on, you will take night training as you progress toward your private pilot certificate. And you'll find that everything you learned under the sun applies to how you fly at night. But no matter when you fly, the fundamentals of flight are the same. This tape concerns itself with introducing you to the aircraft, its systems and controls, basic aerodynamics, pre-flight, engine start, taxi, and basic communications. We'll also explain the four basic maneuvers upon which the rest of your flight training will be built. Climbs, descents, straight and level, and turns. And to further enhance the value of these tapes to your actual flying, it is our privilege to introduce you to Richard L. Collins, hosting segments we call Air Facts. During the Air Facts segments, you're going to get a dose of the real world of flying from one of aviation's most experienced and prestigious authorities. Richard Collins holds ratings all the way up to airline transport pilot, but is probably best known as the editor-in-chief of Flying Magazine for 11 years, and most recently, editor-in-chief and publisher of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association's Pilot Magazine and Aviation USA. He has written 10 books and over 800 articles, columns, and editorials concerning aviation during a career that began in 1957 as a pilot for a construction company and has since accrued over 16,000 flight hours and has flown left seat in almost every type of airplane there is. Late in 1958, Richard Collins became managing editor of the popular Air Facts magazine and today brings his vast experience to you in these Air Facts segments. One of the really neat things about learning to fly is the new relationship you develop with weather. You develop an interest in highs and lows and fronts and the jet stream and the effect that these things have on weather. Most pilots watch the morning TV shows just to get an idea of what the synopsis is going to be that day and, and watch the forecast to see if the forecast is right or if the forecast is wrong. Even if you're not going flying on a specific day, you can study the weather and vicariously make the decision whether or not you would have flown that day. Good practice. The weather knowledge you'll gain in studying for your private pilot written is a basic outline of what you need to know. Most pilots take their study of weather a lot farther, mainly because it's enjoyable to study the elements. There are a lot of great books you can read to increase your weather knowledge. One thing that we all learn early on is that weather is what you see and feel, not what is forecast. Forecasting, especially forecasting more than a few hours ahead of time, is not an exact science. That's why a real pilot is what you might call, well, a weather junkie. And you know, today it was supposed to snow this afternoon, 100% chance of snow, and it's 2 o'clock and not a flake has fallen. You know, a real weather junkie is never surprised when the forecast goes back. And now, let's take an introductory look at the aircraft controls and the aerodynamics that make it fly. The four forces which act on an airplane in flight are lift, weight, thrust, 
and drag. Lift is the force that acts upward against weight, which is caused by gravity. Thrust propels the airplane forward, and drag acts opposite of thrust. Now let's begin with lift and take a brief look at how lift is produced and how the airplane is controlled by the pilot. Because an airplane is heavier than air, the wings must do something to the surrounding air to make the air support the weight of the airplane. A Swiss mathematician, Daniel Bernoulli, found that if the speed or velocity of a fluid or gas is increased, there will be a decrease in pressure at the point of the increase in speed. Looking at the cross section of the wing, we can see that the upper surface is curved and the lower surface is relatively flat. As airflow meets the wing, the air flowing over the top curve or camber is speeded up, decreasing the pressure on the top of the wing. This decreased pressure is the major source of the lift needed to make the airplane fly. However, we must also consider the effect of the air striking the bottom of the wing and being deflected downward. As the wing pushes down on the air, the air exerts an equal and opposite force on the wing. The increased pressure on the bottom of the wing also creates lift. While the decrease in pressure on top of the wing is the greater source of lift, the lift made by increased pressure at the bottom of the wing is important when we look at the total lift needed to fly the airplane. The increased pressure below the wing is a working model of the concept of action-reaction, which is credited to Sir Isaac Newton. Interestingly, the discoveries made by Bernoulli and Newton in the late 17th and early 18th centuries are the basis for heavier-than-air flight, but they weren't seriously explored until early this century. Before we leave airfoils, let's name the principal parts of an airfoil. The front is called the leading edge, and the back is called the trailing edge. In cross-section, an imaginary line drawn between the leading and trailing edges is called the wing cord. Later, we'll see that the relationship between the wing cord and airflow is important when we control lift. The top surface is called the upper camber, and the bottom of the wing is the lower camber. In the next video volume, we'll continue with an in-depth look at all the forces involved in flight. An airplane in flight is free to rotate around three axes which pass through the airplane's center of gravity. The axis which passes through the length of the fuselage is the longitudinal or long axis. Movement around this axis is called roll or bank. The axis which passes through the wings at a right angle to the fuselage is the lateral axis and movement around this axis is pitch. The remaining axis, which passes down through the fuselage at a right angle to both the longitudinal and lateral axes, is the vertical axis. Yaw is movement around the vertical axis. To maneuver an airplane, you must control its movement around these three axes. This is done by moving the primary control surfaces, the elevator, ailerons, and rudder from the neutral position into the airflow. Let's look at each of the primary control surfaces, how they work in flight, and the inputs we use to move them. Ailerons, the control surfaces at the outboard ends of the wings, control roll. Pitch is controlled by the elevator, and the rudder controls yaw. The horizontal and vertical stabilizers act like the feathers on the tail of an arrow to balance the wing and help keep the aircraft on a straight course. Pulling the yoke back moves the elevator to rotate the airplane around the lateral axis pitching the nose up. Conversely, pushing the yoke forward will move the elevator, pitching the nose down. But if you've seen an airplane upside down, you'll realize the pilot of the inverted airplane has to think in terms of the nose moving toward or away from him, not up or down. Some airplanes have a stabilator, which combines the functions of the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator. When the yoke is moved, the entire stabilator is moved, raising or lowering the leading edge of the stabilator. During this video, we will use the word elevator for movement or control of both the elevator or stabilator. 
The word stabilator is a derivative of the elevator stabilizer arrangement, and you can see how it got its name. Turning the control yoke moves the ailerons, and moving the yoke fore and aft controls the elevator. This allows either the elevator or the ailerons to be moved individually or simultaneously. Turning the yoke to the right will move the right aileron up while the left aileron moves down. Air flowing over the deflected ailerons will make the airplane roll around the longitudinal axis and bank to the right. With the yoke turned to the left, the left aileron is up and the right aileron is down, making the airplane bank to the left. The bank will continue to increase until the ailerons are returned to the neutral position. When the ailerons are in the neutral position, the aircraft tends to stay in the bank until the yoke is turned opposite the bank to make the ailerons roll the airplane back to a wings level position. Pushing the right rudder pedal moves the rudder to the right, causing the airflow to move the tail to the left, which yaws, not turns the nose to the right. Pushing on the left rudder pedal will yaw the nose to the left. Why does an airplane have a rudder if it doesn't turn the airplane? Let's take another look at what happens when the ailerons are deflected into the airflow. The deflected ailerons change the wing cord of the outboard part of the wings, which in turn changes the lift of the wings. Also, the down aileron is in higher pressure, while the up aileron is in lower pressure. The drag, or retarding force, is greater on the wing with the down aileron, causing the aircraft to yaw to the opposite side of the bank. The tendency to yaw opposite the bank is called adverse yaw. In turning flight, the rudder's only function is to counteract the adverse yaw, which happens as the airplane is rolled into a turn and when it's rolled back to wings level flight. Trim tabs are used to relieve the pressure or force needed to hold a primary control surface out of the streamlined position. Trim tabs are attached to the trailing edge of the primary control surface. The trim tab is moved opposite the position of the elevator to reduce the pressure the pilot must use to hold the elevator into the airflow. The position of the elevator determines the speed of the airplane and the elevator trim is used to maintain a constant speed, not a constant pitch. Some trim tabs can be adjusted in flight, while other more simple tabs can only be adjusted on the ground. Airplanes used for primary instruction usually have an in-flight adjustable trim tab for the elevator and may also have a trim system for the rudder. The flaps are the panels on the trailing edge of the inboard parts of the wings. Unlike the ailerons, both flaps are extended and retracted at the same time. Lowering the flaps changes the cord of the wing and increases both lift and drag. Extending the flaps allows the landing approach to be steeper and slower. On some airplanes, flaps are also used to shorten the takeoff run. This completes our first look at the natural forces acting on the airplane in flight. To be a safe and efficient pilot, you must understand the principles involved and learn to either utilize or counteract these natural forces. Coming up in a moment, Rob is going to take you inside the cockpit for a look at the instruments and controls. For now, let's examine some of the airplanes in which you might be training. The Cessna 152 is a high-wing, two-place trainer that cruises around 100 knots. The larger four-place 172, also known as a Skyhawk, will cruise around 110 knots. The 152 and 172 probably represent the largest percentage of the training fleet. If you're training in a low-wing model, the two-place Piper Tomahawk or Beechcraft Skipper both have cruise performance of around 100 knots and are identifiable by their distinctive T-tails and bubble-like cockpits. The Piper Warrior and its derivative, the Piper Cadet, cruise at around 110 knots and, like all of these trainers we've mentioned, have an endurance of just over four hours with full tanks at best cruise speed. We're using the Cadet for most of this tape, but when there are significant differences between models, we'll try to point them out. Now let's move inside the cockpit and take a look at the flight instruments and the rest of the airplane panel. 
Most training airplanes have fully functioning dual controls and can be flown from either side. Traditionally, the pilot flies the airplane from the left side, which takes some practice getting into gracefully. Some training airplanes have tandem or front and back seating. The instrument panel has the flight, navigation, and engine instruments on the left side. The radios, engine controls, fuel controls, switches, and circuit breakers are positioned within reach of either pilot. The flight instruments are the airspeed indicator, attitude indicator, altimeter, vertical speed indicator, turn coordinator, and heading indicator, also called the directional gyro. Airspeed indicators may be marked in knots or miles per hour, or both. Airspeed indicators in newer airplanes are usually only marked in knots, and we'll use knots in these tapes. Knots are a measure of speed based on nautical, or sea miles. Aviation uses both nautical and statute miles for measuring distances and speeds. A nautical mile is 6,076.1 feet. The decimal can be dropped and still be reasonably accurate. A statute mile is 5,280 feet. A nautical mile equals 1.15 statute miles. To convert nautical miles to statute miles, multiply nautical miles by 1.15. We normally say that the airspeed indicator measures the speed of the airplane through the air. However, it's also correct to say that airspeed is the speed at which the air is flowing over the airplane. The speed ranges and limitations marked on the airspeed indicator are for the make and model airplane in which the indicator is installed. Different makes and models of airplanes will have the marking at different speeds. The speed marked by the red line should never be exceeded. Speeds in the yellow arc should only be flown in smooth air. The green arc denotes the normal operating airspeed range. Rate of climb or descent in feet per minute is measured by the vertical speed indicator, and the altimeter measures the altitude or height of the airplane above sea level. An altimeter has three hands, just like a clock. The fastest moving hand, which looks like a minute hand, is the hundreds of feet hand. The short hand reads in thousands of feet, and the longest hand, which moves the slowest, indicates tens of thousands of feet. Let's try reading some altimeter indications. This altimeter shows no tens of thousands of feet, no thousands of feet, and the hundreds of feet hand is between 800 and 900 feet. Each of the lines between 800 and 900 feet represents 20 feet. The altimeter shows 840 feet. Let's see what an altimeter would show at the highest airport in the United States. The tens of thousands of feet hand shows almost 10,000 feet. The thousands of feet hand shows almost 10,000 feet. And the hundreds of feet hand shows about 930 feet. The altimeter indicates 9,930 feet. Leadville Lake County Airport in Colorado is 9,927 feet above sea level. The traffic pattern altitude at Leadville is 800 feet above the airport. At traffic pattern altitude, the altimeter shows 10,727 feet. Let's go to the other extreme. Calipatria Municipal Airport in California is 180 feet below sea level. This altimeter shows either 180 feet below sea level or 99,820 feet. Knowing that the altimeter isn't in a spacecraft lets you decide that 180 feet below sea level is the correct indication. On some altimeters, the tens of thousands of feet hand is the shortest hand. Let's look at the altitudes we discussed using this altimeter. Here's 840 feet, 9,927 feet, and 10,727 feet. And lastly, 180 feet below sea level. Since the altimeter reading is based on barometric pressure and barometric pressure is constantly changing, the altimeter must be set prior to every flight. The attitude indicator uses a gyroscope to stabilize a horizon bar which stays parallel to the natural horizon. The miniature airplane, P-51, 
pitches and banks around the horizon bar the same way your training airplane pitches and banks around the natural horizon. Earlier names for this instrument, which might be more descriptive, were the artificial horizon and the gyro horizon. The magnetic compass is located away from metal and electrical wiring to reduce the effect of local magnetic fields. The lubber line shows the direction the airplane is pointing. The lubber line, instrument case, and the airplane move around the compass card, which remains oriented to magnetic north. Compass accuracy is also affected by turns, banks, and speed changes. So the heading indicator is the principal direction instrument used in flight. Because the heading indicator is gyroscopically stabilized, it's not affected by banks, turns, and speed changes. However, the heading indicator isn't a compass and must be set to the compass indication before takeoff and periodically adjusted to the compass indication while the airplane is in steady level flight. Another gyroscopic instrument, the turn coordinator, gives us information about the direction and rate of the turn. The ball, or inclinometer, which is under the turn coordinator, shows the quality of the turn. The power setting is shown on the tachometer, which shows the revolutions per minute of the engine, and it's marked to indicate the maximum permissible RPM of the engine. The engine controls begin with the throttle, which is like the accelerator pedal on a car. Push forward to open the throttle and increase power. Pull back to close the throttle and decrease power. For some of you, this may be different from some other power equipment you might be accustomed to operating. Unlike the car accelerator, the throttle will stay in the position set by the pilot. The throttle friction lock adjusts the ease with which the throttle can be moved. Also, unlike an automobile, the airplane engine has a mixture control which regulates the ratio of gasoline to air entering the fuel distribution system. Push forward to increase or enrich, and pull back to lean or decrease the amount of fuel in relationship to the amount of air. Fuel is pumped directly into the engine cylinder or cylinders by the hand-operated primer. When the carburetor heat control is on, heated air enters the carburetor. Unheated air is used when the control is off. Engine instruments and gauges are marked with green to show normal indications and red for abnormal indications. The oil pressure and temperature gauges are used to monitor engine operation. And if the engine has an electric fuel pump, there will be a switch to operate the electric pump and a fuel pressure gauge to monitor the fuel pressure. The gyroscopes in the attitude indicator and the heading indicator are usually driven by air pressure. The vacuum gauge enables the pilot to check the operation of the engine-driven vacuum pump. Fuel gauges show the approximate fuel in the tanks and the fuel selector allows the pilot to select the fuel tank in use and also turn off the fuel. This finishes our look at the instruments and panel of a typical training airplane. It's a great idea to spend some time on your own just sitting in the airplane learning the position of the switches, instruments, and gauges. This will really pay off. You'll be able to concentrate on flying the airplane because you will already be familiar with the cockpit and the instrument panel. Spend some time getting to know your airplane. It'll be time well spent. If you're training in one of the Cessna high-wing airplanes, right away you're going to notice some differences when you enter the cockpit. Beginning with the engine controls, the throttle and mixture control are push-pull knobs with the friction adjustments at the base. The carb heat control is also pulled out to apply carb heat and pushed in to turn it off. The Cessnas do not have electric fuel pumps. The fuel is gravity-fed from the high wings. The fuel selector in the 172 has a setting to draw fuel from both tanks simultaneously as well as either tank individually. The 152's fuel selector, located between the seats, has only on-off positions and fuel is always drawn from both tanks at the same time. The electrical system master switch is split, dividing control between the battery and alternator, but doing it with one split switch instead of two individual switches. The Cessna ammeters are also different. 
Instead of showing the load on the electrical system like the pipers, the Cessna ammeters show a charging-discharging condition with positive-negative readings. On the panel is a switch controlling the electrically operated flaps with detent positions for the different flap settings. As you activate the switch, the electric motors respond as the flaps deploy, giving you that airline captain feeling. These are the main differences you'll encounter between low and high wing trainers. The controversy over the superiority of each design still rages unabated, with the camps divided fairly evenly. But no matter which model you fly, the interiors are laid out so that the pilot uses the left hand to operate the control wheel, while the right hand handles the throttle, mixture, and other controls. Most training airplanes use four-stroke internal combustion reciprocating engines, which operate on the same principles as automobile engines. A reciprocating engine converts the back and forth motion of the pistons to the rotary motion of the crankshaft. Let's take a look at a typical training airplane engine. This engine, courtesy of Purdue University, has had several pieces cut away to expose various moving parts. The basic parts of the engine are cylinders, pistons, which are inside the cylinders, valves at the top of each cylinder, connecting rods linking the piston to the crankshaft, and the crankcase, which is the metal frame. Each cylinder has two spark plugs. Using computer graphics, here are the five events in the cycle of a four-stroke engine. At the start of the cycle, the intake stroke, the piston is moving in toward the crankshaft and the intake valve is open. This allows the fuel-air mixture to flow from the carburetor through the intake manifold into the cylinder. As the piston starts moving out away from the crankshaft, both valves are closed and the fuel-air mixture is compressed in the cylinder. This stroke is called the compression stroke. As the piston nears the end of its outward travel, the fuel-air mixture is ignited and the rapid burning and expansion of the fuel pushes the piston toward the crankshaft in the power stroke. During the exhaust stroke, the last stroke in the cycle, the piston moves out and the exhaust valve is opened and the burned gases are forced out of the cylinder. As a cylinder is undergoing this cycle, the other cylinders are each going through different parts of the cycle. No matter how many cylinders an engine has, each of the cylinders will complete the cycle every time the crankshaft makes two revolutions. More cylinders will make a smoother engine because there are more power strokes for each revolution of the crankshaft. Burning of the fuel-air mixture produces heat, and most of it is evacuated through the exhaust system. Airplane engines are air-cooled. Baffles guide and confine the flow of air to the heat-critical parts of the engine. The cylinders have cooling fins, which increase the effectiveness of the airflow. The cooling air enters the front of the engine compartment, passes over the baffled fins, and exits through the rear of the engine cowling. Engine lubricating oil performs three functions. First, it coats the surfaces of all moving parts with a slick film preventing direct metal-to-metal -metal contact. Second, it dissipates heat as it circulates through the oil cooler. And third, it carries any foreign materials to the oil filter. Because oil is required for both lubrication and heat dissipation, the oil pressure and temperature gauges are important indicators of engine operation and condition. There are three types of oil used in airplane reciprocating engines. Straight mineral oil, synthetic oil, and ashless dispersant oil. Although most people refer to oils such as AeroShell W as detergent oils, they are really ashless dispersant oils. A dispersant oil contains an additive that suspends contaminants such as carbon, lead compounds, and dirt. This allows them to be filtered out or drained with the oil rather than deposited within the engine. This type of oil keeps foreign particles in solution without the disadvantages of ash-forming detergent additives. Refer to your pilot's operating handbook or engine manufacturer's recommendations for the correct type of oil to use in your engine.
Another reason airplane engines are so reliable is that they have a dual or two magneto ignition system. The magnetos generate the spark which ignites the fuel-air mixture in the cylinders. The magnetos allow the engine to run independently of the airplane's battery and electrical system and is one of the redundancies built into the airplane for safety. As you saw before, each cylinder has two spark plugs and each spark plug is energized by a different magneto. The advantage is safety. If one magneto fails, the engine will continue to run on the other magneto. Two spark plugs in each cylinder also makes the combustion of the fuel-air mixture more efficient, resulting in improved performance. The ignition switch in the cockpit has five positions, off, right, left, both, and start. With the switch in the left or right position, the engine is running on only one of the magnetos and only one set of spark plugs. When the switch is placed in the both position, both magnetos are supplying ignition and all spark plugs are firing. During engine run-up, you'll check both magnetos to be sure they're operating correctly. Check your airplane flight manual or pilot's operating handbook for the correct procedure for your airplane. Remember, always place the switch on both for flight and to off after shutting the engine down. Not all of us are so mechanically inclined that we're going to sit here and fly along and wonder about what uh, every piston and valve and, and rod and cylinder is doing or about the technicalities of oil. The one thing that good pilots do learn is a really very healthy respect for machinery because engines tend to like uh, to be taken care of. They like tender love and care and uh, they tend to return every kindness. If throttle movements, for example, are smooth, the engine feels good about the hand on the throttle. On the other hand, the engine doesn't like pilots who slam bang their way through power increases and reductions. Engines like gradual temperature changes which simply means that after starting, especially in cold weather, let the engine run for a minute or so before using a lot of power to start taxiing. A rule of thumb is to not use full power for takeoff less than four minutes after startup in warm weather, six minutes in cold weather. That gives that good old greasy oil you just learned about time to warm up and for the lubrication process to be complete. You know, much is made about the cost of aircraft engines, but they're quite reliable as well as economical. The uh, engine in the Piper Cadet is really good for 2,000 hours time between overhaul, and that translates into over 200,000 miles. Try that in your old Chevy. The fuel tanks on present-day light training airplanes are located in the wings and are filled through openings in the top of the wings that are covered by caps. Fuel lines carry the fuel from the tanks to the engine. The fuel system also includes vents, which permit air to replace the fuel consumed during flight. Overflow vents allow for expansion of fuel caused by high temperature. You may see some fuel dripping from these vents, particularly after topping off the tanks during hot weather. Drain valves are located on the bottom of each tank to allow you to drain fuel samples to check for water or sediment and proper fuel. Water or sediment, being heavier than fuel, settles to the bottom of the tanks. Also, a strainer drain called a gascalator will be at the lowest point in the fuel lines between the fuel selector and the engine. It's another safety element in the fuel system and it allows the fuel to be filtered. Plus, it traps any water or sediment so it can be drained before it reaches the engine. Always follow the airplane or engine manufacturer's guidelines about the type of fuel to be used in the engine. Using a grade lower than specified is likely to cause engine damage. For safety, aviation fuels are color-coded and octane rated. So know the color and octane rating of the fuel needed for your engine and check it before every flight. You'll find that 80 octane is red, 100 low lead is blue, and straight 100 octane is green. Jet A is clear or straw colored. Never use Jet A fuel in a gasoline engine. Jet fuel is essentially high grade kerosene, which is why jets are sometimes referred to as kerosene burners. Mixing octanes cancels the colors 
and the fuel will be clear. It's another safety factor to alert you to double check your fuel. High wing airplanes use gravity to deliver the fuel to the engine. Low wing airplanes use two pumps. One is engine driven and the other is electrically operated and controlled by the pilot from a switch on the instrument panel. All fuel pump systems will include a pressure gauge on the instrument panel to show fuel pressure in the lines. The gauge will be color coded for the proper range or you can check the airplane flight manual or pilot's operating handbook for the proper pressure reading. The electric pump is normally used during takeoff and landings as a backup for the engine driven pump. Fuel pump failures are rare, but during takeoff and landing, when you are low and slow, is not when you want engine trouble. The two pumps are another redundant system for safety. As an aid in starting the engine, especially in cold weather, most airplanes have a manual fuel primer installed in the cockpit. It's a hand-operated pump that draws fuel from the fuel line and squirts it directly into one or more of the cylinders. The fuel line on most light airplanes runs to a carburetor on the engine. This mixes the liquid fuel with air and vaporizes it before it enters the engine intake manifold. One of the causes of a possible engine stoppage is carburetor icing. In the carburetor, the cooling caused by vaporization of gasoline and the pressure decrease can reduce temperature by as much as 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This cooling may change water vapor in the air to frost or ice inside the carburetor. The ice formed in the throat of the carburetor reduces fuel flow, causing lower power, and may cause engine stoppage. You don't have to be concerned about carburetor ice on dry days or when the temperature is well below freezing because there's usually not enough moisture in the air to cause icing. However, when there's high humidity or visible moisture, and the temperature is between 20 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, beware of carburetor icing, especially at low or idle power settings. On engines with fixed pitch propellers, the sign of carburetor icing is a gradual reduction of RPM at a constant throttle setting. With a float type carburetor, heat is used to melt the ice and prevent further ice formation. Pulling the carburetor heat control on heats the engine intake air by diverting it over the exhaust manifold. The heated air melts the ice that has formed and stops further ice formation. If there's no carburetor ice, there will be a slight drop in engine RPM because of the heated intake air, but the engine would run smoothly and the RPM won't increase. When you turn the heat off, the RPM will return to what it was before carburetor heat was applied. If you suspect carburetor icing, apply full carburetor heat immediately. If there is carburetor ice, the engine will run somewhat rough with a further drop in RPM as the ice, which is now water, enters the cylinders. After the ice is melted and the water is exhausted from the engine, the RPM will increase. Carburetor heat is usually not used on takeoff since the heated air does reduce engine power. During the engine run-up part of the pre-takeoff check is when the carburetor heat function is normally checked. Again, check your airplane flight manual or the pilot's operating handbook for the correct procedure for your airplane. The propeller is simply a rotating airfoil, or as the British call it, an air screw. When a propeller is turning, it produces thrust in much the same way as a wing produces lift. A close look shows the propeller is twisted, and the reason is so it can produce equal thrust from the hub to the tip and pull the airplane through the air. As the propeller rotates, the blade tip travels faster than the blade area near the hub because the tip must travel a greater distance in the same amount of time. So to equalize the amount of lift over the entire length of the blade, it is twisted more at the hub and less at the tip. Most training airplanes are equipped with a fixed pitch propeller that provides the best compromise between climb and cruise for the engine and airframe combination. As the name implies, the propeller pitch or blade angle is fixed and cannot be changed by the pilot. The propeller on most training airplanes is connected directly to the engine crankshaft 
and therefore propeller RPM and engine RPM are the same. The throttle in the cockpit enables the pilot to control the RPM of the engine and fixed pitch propeller combination and thus power output. Basically, the more RPM, the more power. A word of caution about propellers. Never lean on or casually turn one. The engine could start. They can be dangerous. Hand starting an airplane engine is a skill you probably will never have to learn and should only be attempted after thorough training in the technique. The electrical system in modern day airplanes is used not only to power the engine starter, but also to supply energy to the instruments, lights, and radio equipment. The battery is the heart of the system. Once the engine is started, an engine-driven generator or alternator supplies current to the system, plus maintains a charge on the battery. Most modern airplanes have alternators rather than generators because the alternators produce more current at a lower RPM than generators. The alternator switch turns on the alternator. The battery master switch activates the electrical system. Once on, electrical energy is supplied to all electric circuits except ignition. As stated earlier, ignition is supplied by the dual magneto system. Circuit breakers are used to safeguard electrical equipment, and an ammeter measures the performance of the entire system. A positive reading shows the system is working. A constant negative or discharge reading means the system is overloaded or the alternator could be bad, and power is being drawn from the battery and not replaced. Also, some ammeters do not indicate battery discharge, but display the load in amperes placed on the generating system. The amount of current shown on the ammeter will tell immediately whether or not the alternator system is operating normally. Check your pilot's operating handbook to understand the type of ammeter used in your airplane. In a moment, we're going to show you how to do good pre-flight inspection, which is something we do before every flight, just like we pull the airplane out of the hangar now with the tow bar. Pre-flight, while it, at first it's going to seem like an awful lot to do before every flight, it's very important. And it's something that we, we don't neglect and we don't make it into a rote ritual. I knew one pilot once who, who went through the motions of looking into the gas tank to verify uh, that he had fuel. And he got in the airplane, started it up, and taxied it out, and noticed that the gauges were on empty, and the tank were actually empty. He had used just the action of taking the cap off and looking in the tank uh, as verifying that he had sufficient fuel for the flight. In cold weather, dress properly for the pre-flight. It's just as important to be thorough on a blustery winter day as it is on a 70-degree day in the springtime. You don't want to rush through just because it's chilly outdoors. The pre-flight will be more enjoyable if you consider it as part of flying. Think about the flying surfaces and what they do as you inspect the airplane. What's the purpose of the pitot tube and the static rims and the stall warning vane? You think about what the pitot tube does, provide information for airspeed indication, you won't likely leave the cover on. When looking at the landing gear, imagine how it reacts when you make a perfect landing or when you make a not so perfect landing, as some of us are prone to do from time to time. When looking at the windshield and windows, consider how important they are to the business of seeing and avoiding other traffic and make sure they're clean and clear. If you make each pre-flight uh, thinking session about each piece of the airplane as you go along, it becomes a, an enjoyable experience. Even on the coldest of days like today, just be sure and wear your woolly bully coat. Every flight really begins a good while before the engine's even started. Part of this process is called the pre-flight inspection. The reason for an airplane pre-flight inspection is to ensure that all systems are working properly and that enough fuel and oil are on board for the intended flight. It's your chance to really look the airplane over inside and out to assure yourself that it's ready to fly. Because once you're airborne, you just can't pull over in case something goes wrong. 
The pre-flight really begins as you approach the airplane. Look at its general appearance for such items as fuel or oil leaks, flat or underinflated struts and tires, snow, ice, or other obstructions on or near the airplane. After this general overview, it's time to become specific. It's a recommended practice to use a written checklist during the pre-flight. This ensures all necessary inspections are completed and gets you in the habit of doing things the same way each time. This is as true for your first flight as it will be on your 1,000th flight. All procedural checklists are included in the pilot's operating handbook. Some airplanes have separate checklists taken from the handbook for use during the pre-flight. In general, during the pre-flight, you're keeping an eye out for items that look different or out of the ordinary. Even though you're not an aircraft mechanic, dented, cracked, or wrinkled surfaces, loose or missing rivets and screws are items you can spot and should be examined more closely for airworthiness by someone very familiar with the airplane. An airplane is fairly symmetrical. Use this to your advantage. If something looks suspicious, check its double on the other side of the airplane. Another general rule is be gentle. Take care when examining control surfaces, antennas, and other parts. While they're designed to withstand in-flight air loads, they can be damaged by rough handling on the ground. It's not necessary to move a control surface to the limits of its travel. Without airflow over them, it's possible to damage them by slamming them against the stops. Start inside the airplane. Confirm that the pilot's operating handbook, radio station license, airworthiness, and registration certificates are on board as required by the Federal Aviation Administration and the Federal Communications Commission. Release the belts holding the controls. Check that circuit breakers are in and the communication and navigation radios, which are called avionics, are off, and the parking brake is set. Electric and magneto switches should be off, and the mixture control in the idle cutoff position. Turn on the battery master switch and note the fuel quantity shown on the fuel gauges. When you visually check the fuel tanks, the amount of fuel in the tanks should agree with the gauge indications. Use the enunciator test switch to check the vacuum, alternator, and oil warning lights. This completes the electrical systems check. Turn the battery master switch off. The flight controls should move easily and in the correct direction. Fully extend and retract the flaps, making sure they move simultaneously. Set the trim tabs in the neutral position. The pitot and static drains are opened momentarily to drain any moisture which may have accumulated in the lines. Make sure they close properly when you're finished. Before leaving the cockpit, glance around to see that the windows are clean. If you're using a tow bar, now's a good time to stow it in the baggage compartment. You're now ready to progress to the exterior inspection. As you move counterclockwise from the cabin, the right wing and control surfaces should be clear of mud, frost, ice, snow, and debris. Pay close attention to the flap and aileron hinges. Check the aileron push rod for security. Remember not to slam the aileron to its full travel. Using only a few fingers, it should move easily and freely without binding or interference with the wing or flap. Make sure to hold the aileron while inspecting the attachment of the push rod. Wind could move it and pinch your fingers. At the wingtip, look at the trailing edge for dents and irregularities. Scrutinize the wingtip, navigation, and strobe lights for apparent damage. The wingtips are especially vulnerable to being struck by other airplanes and vehicles. As you walk along the leading edge, look for dents or wrinkled skin which could be a sign of internal damage. Removing the tank filler cap, visually confirm that the quantity is approximately what the fuel gauge indicated. The fuel color should also be visible in the tank. Be sure the cap is replaced securely. A loose fuel cap may allow the in-flight airflow to siphon fuel out of the tank. Under the wing, look at the fuel tank drain valve for leakage. 
draw a few ounces of fuel from the tank with your fuel sampler. If you find any contaminants, keep draining the fuel until there are no indications of further contamination. Any time you use a fuel drain, be sure that it closes completely and does not continue leaking. You can tell from the fuel color whether the fuel is the proper type and octane for your engine. Scatter the drained fuel downwind away from the airplane. Pouring the fuel in one place can ruin blacktop and kill grass. The fuel tank vent must be open and clear of blockage to let air replace the fuel used in flight. Next, remove the wing tie-down and check the bottom of the wing for damage and wrinkles. About four and a half inches of the bright metal of the main landing gear struts should be exposed. The tire should appear properly inflated and not have cuts, bruises, or bald spots. Check the wheel halves for cracks and broken flanges. As you look at the right wheel and brake system, look across and compare it to the left one. They should appear the same and be relatively free of dirt and oily fluid. After checking that the right fresh air inlet is clear, open the engine compartment and look for anything out of the ordinary such as loose wires, bolts, nuts, clamps, oil or fuel leaks. The engine compartment is a favorite place for birds to nest, so be alert for that as well. Worn or missing engine baffle seals can cause improper cooling airflow and engine overheating and damage. Check the oil quantity. Add some oil if it's needed. Be sure it's the right type and viscosity. When replacing the dipstick, screw it in snug, but don't over tighten it. Especially so if the engine is warm. As the engine cools and metal contracts, the next pilot will have a hard time unscrewing it. Close and secure the cowl. Look the nose section over for general condition, leaks and security of the cowling. Clean the windshield if necessary. The spinner and propeller should be free from nicks and cracks. Run your hand along the tip, leading and trailing edges of each blade. Don't move the propeller while you're doing this. Blade nicks more than an eighth of an inch deep should be looked at by a licensed mechanic. The front cowl openings should be free from obstructions. Check the alternator belt for tension and wear. The landing light should be clean and clear. While looking over the nose gear, be sure to stay clear of the propeller arc. About three and a quarter inches of the strut should be exposed. Check the tire and wheel halves. Look at the bottom of the fuselage for oil or fuel leaks and damage. Don't forget to remove the chalk. It's embarrassing to have to shut the engine down and climb out of the airplane just to pull the chalk. Scan the surface for stones and debris that could be picked up by the propeller and damage the airplane or prop. Moving around to the left side of the nose, open the engine compartment and examine this side as you did the other side. The oil cooler is located here and it should not have debris clogging the cooling fins. After closing in the engine compartment, drain and check some fuel from the engine fuel strainer. The left wing and landing gear are checked in the reverse order of the right wing. The only difference is the addition of the pitot-static mast. It has very small holes which should be clear. The front opening is the pitot and the static opening is in the back. The left side of the fuselage is checked, including visually inspecting the condition and security of the radio antennas. The stabilator vertical stabilizer and rudder should be clear of frost, ice, and snow. Gently move the stabilator, seeing that it and the trim tab are not damaged, and move freely. Check the attachment of the trim tab push rod. Look at the vertical stabilizer, rudder, rotating beacon, and position light for damage. The rudder hinges should be secure, and the rudder should move freely. After removing the tail tie down, continue on the right side of the fuselage and return to the cockpit. Turn on the battery master switch and the airplane lighting. After seeing that the cabin lights are working, walk around to see that the exterior lights are illuminating properly. At the left wing leading edge, gently lift the stall warning vane, listening for the stall warning horn. 
After entering the cabin and turning the switches off, the pre-flight inspection is complete. Before we move on to the engine start, let's take a look at some of the main differences you'll encounter when pre-flighting either of the Cessna high wing trainers. First, in the cockpit, the control wheel lock is likely to be installed on the control column itself. Many of the external pre-flight inspection differences are related to the high wing design. For instance, the ailerons and flaps are only checked from below the wing. The hinges are not clearly visible from above while standing on the ground. The fuel drain valves under the wing are mounted flush to the wing skin and require a fuel sampler cup with a center mounted push in adapter to drain the fuel. To check the fuel quantity visually through the filler cap requires a bit of climbing. Most Cessna trainers have a step and handle to aid in getting up there. When it comes time to check the oil, there is only a small door available which opens directly over the oil filler cap. The oil dipstick is checked in the same way but this small access limits your ability to give the engine compartment as complete a going over. Also located here is the drain valve control for the engine fuel drain. Pull up on this handle to drain fuel from the engine sump. It is difficult to keep the fuel from falling directly on the ground. The last of the major differences involves the design of the pitot tube, the fuel vents, and the stall warning opening. Just as in any other aircraft, they should be free from debris and obstructions. Whatever model trainer you learn in, during the pre-flight inspection, follow the manufacturer's checklist and keep an eye out for anything that looks out of the ordinary. Another part of the before-flight checklist is the engine start checklist. It's important to make sure that the tail of your airplane is not pointed at any people, other aircraft, or anything that might be damaged by the wind blast from your propeller. This is a matter of courtesy as well as safety. Following the manufacturer's checklist, we want to first make sure that the parking brake is set. Also, be ready to use the foot pedal brakes should the parking brake not hold. This is done to keep the aircraft from moving once the engine starts. Confirm that the carb heat control is in the off position. In the off position, air entering the engine is filtered to keep out dirt and dust. Check that the fuel selector valve handle is on the desired tank. Open the throttle about a quarter of an inch. This allows fuel to enter the engine and keeps the engine at a low speed when it starts, lessening wear. Assure other electrical equipment such as radios and lights are off. Then turn the battery master and alternator switches on. During the engine start, the electrical system is subjected to some rather unusual voltages. Plus, you want all available power for starting the engine. Put the mixture control in the full rich position. Turn the electric fuel pump on and check that the fuel pressure indicator comes up into the green arc of the fuel pressure gauge. If it's the first engine start of the day or a cold day, it may be necessary to use one or more strokes of the primer. The pilot's operating handbook can help you gauge how many strokes are necessary. Confirm the primer is locked when you've finished. Next, open a window and call clear to let people know you're ready to start the engine. Give people time to react and look to see that the propeller is clear. Turn the key to start, and when the engine starts, release it. Once the engine runs smoothly, adjust the speed to around 1,000 RPM and check for proper oil pressure. Normally, oil pressure should appear within a few seconds and somewhat longer in very cold weather. If oil pressure is not in the green arc within 30 seconds, shut the engine off and consult an aircraft mechanic. Once the engine is running, turn on all necessary electrical equipment, such as radios and lights. This is the procedure for a normal cold start. Hot starts, flooding, and colder winter weather all call for different starting procedures. English is the international language of aviation, but as in all trades and professions, the words and phrases used can be confusing to beginners. Understanding what is said on the radio depends in a large measure on knowing what to expect. Be patient. 
As you learn the words and phrases, aviation communications will soon become easy. Using the radio in an airplane is much like using the telephone. The biggest difference is that both parties can't talk simultaneously. When you make a phone call, you first ask for the person you want to talk to. Next, you identify yourself. And after your conversation, you acknowledge the information and say goodbye. Let's listen to how this is done using the airplane radio. Looking ground control. Cadet 9158 Juliet at the south line. Taxi for eastbound departure. Cadet 9158 Juliet, taxi two and hold short, runway two right. Altimeter 29097, wind 020 at 5. Tower on 118.7 when you're ready. Roger, 9158 Juliet. Our call consisted of four W's. The first W is, who are you calling? Specifically, the name of the ground station. The second W is, who are you? This is the full call sign for your airplane. If your request is routine or short, go ahead with the next W. Where are you? The controller needs to know your location in order to give taxi directions. The last W, what do you want, was the request for taxi information. Since this is routine, it was made on the initial call. An important part of all communications is acknowledgement that you've received the clearance or call-up. This is usually done by using the word Roger and the airplane call sign. I know this sounds too easy, but the four W's cover most of your radio communications. Let's take a closer look at each of the W's. First, who you're calling. During your first few hours, you might be talking to a tower or to a Unicom station. What we call a tower may have several distinct responsibilities. In the early days, these were all handled by the tower controller in the glass cage. But as air traffic increased, it became necessary to divide the workload. Two of the tower services you are most likely to use during your early flights are ground and tower. Ground control is responsible for controlling the use of taxiways and ramp areas. This function is called by the airport name and ground. Tower assigns and controls the use of runways for takeoff and landing. Again, use the airport name and the word tower. Unicom is a non-government radio station. Unicom is an acronym for Unified Communications and it's available at many airports which do not have a control tower. You can request airport advisory information on the Unicom frequency. Calls to Unicom are made by using the airport name and the word Unicom. For example, Claremont Unicom. You should be aware that a Unicom station is not always attended. We've not talked about all the who's you'll communicate with during your flying career, but have limited the discussion to those you'll most likely use during your early training. The second W is who are you? And it's quite simple. Your call sign is the make, model, or type of airplane, followed by all the numbers and phonetic letters of the airplane registration, omitting the prefix letter N, which is the prefix for aircraft registered in the United States. This airplane is Cherokee 4713 Lima. This airplane is Cessna 529073. The third W is where are you? This is your location on the airport, or, if in the air, your position such as 10 miles east. The fourth W is what do you want? If your request is lengthy or out of the ordinary, make an initial call, which is who you are calling and who you are, followed by the word over. Over is used to say, I've finished my transmission and await your reply. Over is not required when the transmission has an obvious end, as in the case of the request for taxi instructions. When the ground station replies, omit who you are calling, they already know. Repeat who you are and then give them your request. There are some basic common sense practices you need to follow when making a radio call. An important one is, listen before you transmit. Keying the transmitter when someone else is transmitting will jam the frequency. Remember, it's a party line. 
it's unprofessional and ineffective to interrupt a communication between another aircraft and the ground station. You should also wait a few seconds before repeating a call. The controller may be busy on another frequency, looking up requested information, or changing the transmitter to your frequency. You'll need to think about and know what you want to say before keying the transmitter. Be precise. Use the minimum number of words necessary to get the message across. Avoid jargon, chatter, and CB slang on the radio. And if you don't understand what the person you're talking to means, ask for clarification. Don't acknowledge a transmission if you don't completely understand what was said. You don't ever want to be confused about instructions. In learning to use the radio, proper use of the microphone is essential. An airplane microphone might look like this one, or look more like a CB microphone. The cockpit can be a loud place, what with all the engine and wind noise. To assure you're heard clearly over the extraneous sounds, hold the microphone close to your lips and speak in a normal but firm voice. If you're doing it properly, your lips will come very close to touching the microphone. Most training airplanes are noisy and you'll be concentrating on flying. Using a headset will make the communications much clearer and will also give you the benefit of hearing protection. Lastly, the controller you're talking to is a human being. If you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. Simply correct yourself and go on with your message. Now, let's see how easy it is to get the clearance for takeoff. Duncan Tower, Cadet 9158 Juliet, ready for departure, runway 20 left, eastbound. Over. 9158 Juliet, cleared on course, cleared for takeoff. Roger, 9158 Juliet. Okay, back in the uh, good old days when we used to fly without radios, uh, we didn't have to worry about the art of aviation communicating, but now we've got uh, good radio equipment, we've got an advanced air traffic control system, and we've got more traffic than ever, so we have to learn the fine art of aviation communicating. And one of the nice things about learning how to fly is that at gift giving time, all those people who said they never knew what to give you can uh, give you something like a good headset. Uh, those folks who give you things now just to kind of run out of excuses not to find you something that uh, is very useful for you. One thing that someone can give you to help in learning to communicate is a radio that receives the VHF aviation frequencies. You can learn a lot about communicating just by listening to other pilots. Because VHF is line of sight, you might only be able to hear the pilot side of the conversation but you can still form a good opinion of what sounds right and what doesn't. When listening to pilots communicate, one thing that you'll quickly decide is that airline pilots and folks flying corporate jets sound like they have the right stuff, where some pilots flying small airplanes sound like they're shouting frenetically at the microphone. Pilots flying helicopters all sound like they have the shakes, not because they do, but because the helicopter shakes a lot. This tells us that how you sound has a lot to do with the environment in which you're talking. If you're wearing a headset, and I don't fly without one, your environment is a quiet one, just like the flight deck of an airline jet, and you're likely to sound cool and collected on the radio. Headsets are a great gift for pilots. Another aid is side tone. If your radio has side tone, the headset will let you hear yourself talking as you make transmissions. This allows you to constantly grade the quality of your transmissions and make improvements. One of the most uh, professional pilots I know does not sound very professional on the radio for two reasons. One of them is that he just absolutely refuses to wear a headset, so he's transmitting in a noisy environment. And without a headset, he doesn't have side tone or he can't hear side tone, so he can't hear himself talking. The result is that even though he's a jet pilot, he sounds like he just started when he's talking on the radio. A person that I taught to fly back in 1963, I thought would really have no trouble on the radio. Uh, but he didn't have an easy time with the radio. And he should have, because he was an expert communicator. He was Hugh Downs, and I was working with him on the Today Show. But the reason that he had trouble with the radio is because he was used to the quiet, orderly environment of the studio, 
And then all of a sudden we put him in a noisy airplane and that was before the days of headsets. And he had trouble with the radio just because of the noise. One other word about communicating. If you're flying from a relatively busy tower controlled airport or are using a congested common traffic advisory frequency, you'll soon see that frequency time is a finite resource. You might have to wait a few minutes to get a word in because another pilot is using a lot of words to say a few things. Don't let that make you say less than you need to say. Just let it remind you that saying what you need to say in as few words as possible is a real piloting virtue, one that convinces everyone that you do indeed have the right stuff. That's all for this tape. Volume 1 continues on tape 2 as Rob takes you step by step through taxi, takeoff, the four fundamentals, and your first look at stalls. Now's a good time to review. After all, that's one of the advantages of videotape. You can review as often as you like. Your first flight instruction is the most important flight instruction you will ever have. That's why Sporties has produced Finding the Best Flight Instruction, an hour and 23 minutes of practical, down-to-earth guidance on how to select the flight school and instructor that's right for you. If you could spend thousands of dollars and several days crisscrossing the country to find the most authoritative people in aviation education, you would talk to the same people Sporties has brought together in this one tape. Hosted by pilot and aviation enthusiast Rob Ryder, finding the best flight instruction takes you step-by-step step through the selection process from identifying your goals to the characteristics of good instruction. You'll get straight talk about the various factors influencing the quality of your flight training, including price, size of the school, and personality of different instructors. In this videotape, you will eavesdrop on a student and instructor during a pre-flight discussion, and then sit in the back seat during the lesson. Hal Shevers, president of Sporty's Pilot Shop, explains why we made this tape. We feel an obligation to everybody who we have uh, motivated into learning to fly. We sell uh, a lot of things through Sporties. We do a lot of advertising. Uh, we have talked a lot of people into this aviation business. And uh, we do have an obligation to you, our customer, and that is to see that you get the most for your money that you can while learning to fly. We can supply you with all the ground school equipment. We can supply you with everything you're going to need up here but we can't physically come out and teach you to fly. We want you to have the best instruction for the dollar possible. To request your free copy of Sporty's Pilot Shop Catalog, or to order Finding the Best Flight Instruction, call Sporty's toll-free at 1-800-LIFTOFF. Ask for catalog number M837, and your VHS copy of Finding the Best Flight Instruction will be sent to you with Sporty's same-day shipping. Whether you are just learning to fly or going for an advanced rating, finding the best flight instruction will be your guide.